false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19.5 So, hello and welcome everybody to the study, uh, the Bible study that we are doing tonight. Uh, we, as uh, Jörg from Juggler 66, <coughs> sorry, Hour of the Truth, and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who I asked, I don't know, about some two years ago, <laughs> with his busy agenda, to do, no, no it's not two years ago, that's ridiculous. It was about the time when Tom read about uh, the foundations under attack on Inquisition Update, that's a little bit more than a year now. And um, I, I know that uh, it is very important and, and that is very, very uh, close to uh, Tom's heart um, to do broadcasts all about the futurist deception of the Antichrist, which he calls the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And uh, already we did already videos on that, uh, you know that. But the point is that there are some chapters in the Bible that are so explicitly warning of this deception that these chapters need to be studied thoroughly. And this is what we are going to do tonight. Today we have the 4th of August 2018, that's a Sabbath evening, uh, with me and a Sabbath noon with Tom, because he's seven hours behind, so when I have eight o'clock, he has one o'clock in the afternoon. And um, we are going to do a study of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, because this is absolutely um, imperative, <laughs> absolutely imperative, and that is no... No word chosen too uh, uh, too hard for that. That is absolutely the way. It is absolutely imperative to understand Second Thessalonians chapter two because that is the clearest chapter in the New Testament, at least to my opinion, where from we can see where, who the Antichrist is. Mm -hmm. All over the Bible, you have the book of Daniel chapter two, chapter seven, chapter nine, which are very important. You have the whole. Gospel of Jesus Christ. You mean the I mean the four Gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, who are actually the fulfilling of the 70th week of Daniel, meaning Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. And then you have Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm sorry, <coughs> the apostle to the Gentiles, who went out to the Gentiles and warned the early churches about the coming apostasy and about the coming of Antichrist. And uh, the point where he made that absolutely clear without any doubts left, if I can say it in these easy words, is Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And that's why Tom and I gathered here together to do a study on that. Maybe for an hour, maybe longer, but for an hour, but then I will just cut the broadcast in two. So then you know that um, there will no there will be a little interruption and then we maybe have two parts. Let's see where the Spirit takes us. And first and for all, with, our, with my long introduction, I'm very sorry, I first want you, of course, to meet Tom Fress, who is with me, connected via Skype. And I hope that we don't encounter any technical problems because I have a new Skype version today and the recorder wasn't running well. And now let's see where the Spirit takes us today. Very, very heartily welcome, Tom, to our... Uh, and hardly, I mean H E R T L Y, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to our Bible study today on the 4th of August. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's nice to be here with you, Yerk, and also with your listeners. And uh, I'm very anxious to discover the, the true message of 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. The very rare but true message of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, uh, from the first verse all the way to the end. 
Is there a possibility you can speak a little bit harder or turn up your microphone or oh something? Because yes, uh, uh, I if if need be, I can uh, turn it up. Let me see if I can turn it up. I used to hear you louder and clearer than this. What uh, what is coming over right now? So I just okay. Uh, if it'll just open for me here, I'll see if I can increase my mic volume. Okay. Um, <coughs> As I said, some technical difficulties can come along tonight because... Okay, is this any better? No, not really, but I hear you loud and clear so far, so I hope that's okay. Otherwise, I just have to give the recording to Brett, and he can put a push up the volumes of the channels. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's possible. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why it's, uh, it's automatically adjusting for me, and I don't know why it's doing that all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. it's, trying, it's trying to knock my volume down a little bit. Anyway... Um, Shall we proceed then, if possible? Yeah, absolutely. Let me just put okay. the... Lo okay, I have the volume now on Skype a little bit harder. This is much better now for me, at least, to listen to. Okay. So this is this is how I used to listen to you, <laughs> okay. in, 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 in the volume. Okay, um, all, this, all, all this stuff aside, Tom, uh, you heard, of course, my little introduction. And uh, I know that I'm speaking right out of your heart when I yes. mention the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. that so many people in, uh, today fall for. And Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 is so important because you told me in the past that for you that was um, a deception to come out of because, you know, today and, and, and a few days before we, we did the study, I was looking on the internet and I just typed in Bible study, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, in Google. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to look at the results. And I found nothing, absolutely zilch, that any study comes even close to what we are going to offer the people today. And the point is that Tom, what Tom offers and what I offer, that is the absolute biblical truth without our own interpretation but we let the Bible interpret itself and we use the correct version of the 1611 King James Bible for you mm -hmm. and we will do and that is at least my idea I hope that Tom agrees with me and of course Tom you can always uh, add any comment that you want on anything you, you can divert to Daniel you can divert to anything that you want mm -hmm. but I first want to read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 the whole chapter which is not so long, just 17 verses. And then I would very much like to do a verse by a verse for verse study of this, if you agree with that. Oh, we're on the same page. It's exactly what I want to do with this. Okay, that's wonderful, Tom. That's wonderful. Okay, let me just turn your volume here a little bit down again. No, okay, that's all right now. <laughs> okay, then I'm going to start. And as I just said, I'm going to read from the King James Version, the authorized version of 1611 Bible. In English, the only preserved Bible today, where God's word is uncorruptedly preserved, because this is based on the Masoretic text in English, in, in uh, Hebrew, sorry, in the old, in the Law and the Prophets, or what most people call the Old Testament, and on the Textus Receptus that came out of Antioch in the New Testament in the Greek version. And all the other versions are corrupted, but I'm not going into that right now, but I'm going to read to you now from Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the whole chapter. Mm -hmm. And it is very important that afterwards we go into a verse-for-verse -verse study, and then we you will know the intention of this uh, recording that we are doing. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except that come falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. 
for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, and establish you in every good word and work. So far, the second epistle, or the second chapter of the second epistle to the Thessalonians, of the King James Version. And now we are going to start a verse-for-verse -verse study, but of course this is not only bound to Second Thessalonians, because I know that Tom has many things on his heart that are related to this study that are taken from other chapters of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You always have to see the Bible in its completion, because when you only read a part of the Bible, you can never ever understand it. And the very simple example for that is, for example, when you read just um, I give you the idea of the book of Revelation there it is spoken about a woman that sits on many waters and you don't understand what that is until in later verses you learn that these many waters are languages people nations multitudes of people the Bible always explains itself sometimes in the same chapter sometimes not in the same chapter but in a later in a later place and therefore it is always important to see the Bible as a whole. Don't nitpick. Don't take out of the Bible what you just like and what fits your understanding, but get the whole Bible and get the whole truth. So, Tom, do you have something inaugurable to say, or shall I just start with verse 1 again and then we do a verse-by-verse -verse study? What's your idea? Well, Yerk, I would like to preface our verse-by-verse -verse study of Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1, by informing the listeners some things they may already know, and that is at the time of Paul's writing of this, uh, this letter to the Thessalonians, is that he had learned that they had received word, a false word, that the coming of the Lord was imminent, that the judgment day of the Lord, the great day of God our Almighty, was imminent. And Paul had to correct them and dispel this false rumor and that had uh, uh, brought great concern among the Thessalonians. And Paul wanted to set the record straight that the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord Jesus, was not imminent and that there were certain things that had to occur before the great and terrible day of the Lord. May I interrupt you here for a second? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you, and I think that this misunderstanding, most of all of the apostles uh, themselves even, was because Jesus at a certain moment spoke about these are the last days. Yes. And that is why many people understood it, so that has to be fulfilled even during our lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, in another place, I think it is in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus Christ even said that uh, even this generation will not perish until. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he comes back or something like that in, in that regard. Yeah. But the point is, Jesus Christ, and let me just make this point because I know you would do it otherwise, but you can, of course, expand on what I'm saying now. Sure. Jesus Christ meant or mentioned that these are the last days because, of course, he knew the prophecy, the prophecy of Daniel because that's he, he, he is correct. God. He knows the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He knew that there were, from the time of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, 540-something A.D. that started, from that time on there were four heathen pagan kingdoms ruling the world. Mm -hmm. And we know that from Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, where this are respectively uh, these kingdoms are mentioned in a, uh, in a statue uh, figure as a man in mm -hmm. chapter 2, or as four beasts in chapter 7. Mm -hmm. So, you have Babylon, which is then being... Um, uh <laughs> Uh, how do you say it? Conquered. Um, conquer, conquered, yes, sorry. Uh, conquered by Medo-Persia, which then is conquered by Greece, and at last you have Roman Empire, the Roman Empire. And you had, of course, two Roman Empires. You have the Pagan Roman Empire, and you have the Papal Roman Empire. Yep. But still, it is Rome. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus Christ walked the earth about 2,000 years ago and did his ministry, when he was 30 years old and baptized in the River Jordan, and for three and a half weeks taught the kingdom of God to the Jews, as was predicted in sure. Daniel chapter 9. Uh, you, you said three and a half weeks, but I know you mean three and, three and a half, half years, years, but go oh, ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, oh, three and a half years, of course. Uh, three and a half years. Um, then, of course, he knew that he was speaking of the last days because the kingdom of Rome would be the last kingdom before his coming back. That's and right everything that is happening here in chapter 2 that we are going to study anyway. So this is why Jesus Christ addressed this as the last days. But you know, the last days, he didn't put a number on them. That's right. <laughs> they are already 2,000 years and they can be much longer or they can be over within a snap of an eye, a snap of the finger or the oh. wink of an eye, you know, mm -hmm. because we don't know when he is going to come back. Mm -hmm. But please continue, Tom. Yes. So... What we are taught in the churches today is not at all what was taught by the Protestant Reformers and by all true Bible-believing Christians before them. Their interpretation of what Paul is writing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is quite different than is what is taught from the churches today. And I believe your listeners, if they're careful to listen, will be startled by the revelation that what is taught in the churches today is so contrary to what it was believed by Christians before us that they will be startled. Uh, rare, if ever, does one hear the proper message that Paul is speaking to the Thess second uh, to his second letter to the Thessalonians, and uh, uh, we're going to point out the error that is taught in the churches today, and the correct, and the historical, and the majority view, the majority uh, interpretation of this of this of this letter. And the great concern of this letter is that the Thessalonians were being deceived by false rumors, false teaching, false prophets who said that the day of the Lord was at hand. Okay, Jesus said it is the last time. We know that to have been his indirect reference to Daniel's prophecy, as you mentioned. First, there was the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and then finally the Roman Empire. And that Roman Empire would continue until Christ's second coming. Okay? We're taught that the Roman Empire fell. That is a lie. The pagan Roman Empire fell, but it just changed emperors. The Caesars... And the, and the emperors of the old pagan Roman Empire were simply replaced by the papacy. The Roman Empire has never fallen. It has just received 
a new head. And there's nothing really new about it either. Pagan Rome, the pagan Roman Empire, simply gradually morphed into the papal Roman Empire. And we need to know that this fourth and final empire on the earth, the Roman Empire, that power that was in power at the time when Christ walked the streets of Jerusalem, we know from Scripture that that empire will continue until Christ's second coming. Now, if you believe that the Rome, as most people do, that the Roman Empire fell, then you must believe that Christ has already come the second time. Has he come? Where is he? He's not come. He's not here. He's not ruling and reigning. The great day of God Almighty, the, 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 the second coming of Christ has not occurred. Therefore, you must believe you must know in your heart that that fourth and final empire that Daniel prophesied is still in power in the world today, just as powerful as it ever was, just as powerful today as it ever will be, and it will not end until Christ's literal return. So if I were to ask any Christian what empire rules the world today, the only correct answer, the only prophetically, the only biblically correct answer is the Roman Empire. More correctly, the papal Roman Empire. All right. So, the day of the Lord, according to Paul, cannot happen until first there is a great falling away. And as a result of that great falling away, that great apostasy, then the man of sin will be revealed. The one who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, the difficult question for my listeners is, we know Jesus has not yet literally returned because the Bible says that he will destroy this man of sin. He will destroy this great wickedness, this great uh, 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 blaspheming uh, pretender when he returns. And so the, the natural question is, who is this one that Paul is speaking of? Okay, Tom, then yeah. I have to interrupt you, mm -hmm. um, because I think it is imperative now that you tell our listeners what is taught in the churches today about this man of sin, this apostasy that we are going to speak of in Thessalon Second Thessalonians. But we are going to reveal uh, what biblically is true, Mm -hmm. is not the same as that what is taught in the churches. That's and right. Let me, be, let me be clear about that. Neither any Protestant church nor any Roman Catholic church, That's not right. any quote-unquote Christian church in the, in the world teaches this as this is taught right here. Maybe here and there a, little f a few Seventh-day Adventists are still holding up to this truth, but even they are falling into greater and greater apostasy. Yeah. So I, th I, th I think it is uh, important, Tom, for you to first explain what is being taught in our quote-unquote churches mm -hmm. all over the world today concerning mm -hmm. this study that we are doing. Beginning in the early to mid-1800s, it began to be taught in the Protestant churches that the Antichrist, or this great falling away, this one who sits in a temple exalting himself above all that is God or, or that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he simply sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, since the middle 1800s, it has been taught in all the churches that this one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped is a future single individual that comes just three and a half years or seven years prior to Christ's literal return. That it's one single individual. 
okay? We would know him as the Antichrist. That's what we're taught in the churches today. There's almost, without exception, no church that does not teach either this, this future Antichrist, or that the Antichrist that Paul spoke of and John and Daniel spoke of was someone of the ancient past who's been already done away with. Okay, it is believed in some of the churches, not many anymore today, but some of the churches teach that the Antichrist preceded the 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 Christian, the so-called Christian Roman Empire, and that this Antichrist, this great falling away, was was uh, one of the Caesars of the old pagan Roman Empire, or even some of them claim the most ridiculous notion that it must have been Alexander the Great or some such thing, which came from the Grecian Empire, not the Roman Empire. And so what is most likely that is that most of your listeners will be churched Christians. They will have been those like me who all of their lives have set in a quote-unquote Christian church somewhere for some period of time in their life, and unlike me, maybe most of your life, and have you always heard of this, 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 uh, uh, this man of sin is a, a, a future, a figment of the future, that he will be one single individual, that he'll come just before Christ's literal return, and uh, he will lead the whole world astray. He will proclaim himself to be God himself in the flesh and he'll lead the whole world astray. The fact of the matter is, Paul was predicting his imminent rise. Okay? He was telling the Thessalonians, contrary to what they had been taught, contrary to how they had been deceived, that the coming of Christ was not imminent, that it would be a long time off, and prior to his coming, the man of sin should be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. All right? The great falling away, the great apostasy, and it would be led by this man of sin, this son of perdition, and that it would not be one single individual that comes just before Christ's return but that it would deceive the whole Christian world and it would rule and reign throughout the Christian era and it would not end until Christ returns to put an end to it, him's very self, by the brightness of his coming and the spirit of his mouth. Now, who do you think that man of sin or that son of perdition might be if it's not a single individual that comes at the very end of time like we've all been taught but someone who was imminently to be identified even by the second thessalonian church long before the coming of christ here we are two thousand years later everyone agrees no one disputes the fact christ has not literally returned he does not rule and reign in visible form. He has not judged the saints. He has not destroyed the Antichrist by the spirit of his mouth or the brightness of his coming. So we must conclude that that man of sin, that son of perdition, not only might have been revealed centuries ago, but might still be in power today. Now, somebody would say immediately to me, Tom, it calls about the man of sin. A man doesn't live 2,000 years. You're telling me that the, the man of sin, the son of, of perdition that Paul spoke about was imminent to be re revealed in the world at the time of the writing of, the second, uh, of his second epistle to the Thessalonians. That's exactly what I'm telling you. The man of sin was indeed revealed not long after Paul's warning to the Thessalonians. Well, not long, yeah. That's uh, dependent on how you see that, because the epistle was well, written about 50, uh, 50 A.D. Yes. And uh, when the Antichrist was revealed, uh, I mean, uh, we, we're going to come to that, Tom. I, I thank you very much for this um, 
introduction, but now I really want to go into a verse by verse study. Okay, there very well. Verses, there are some verses that don't need any further explanation, but there are some verses that we should really go into. Certainly. Now, yeah, now let, let's tell the people, I mean, you, you, you just told them what they are being taught in the churches and everywhere around the world. And that's exactly the same thing that when you type in in your Google or whatever search engine on the internet, Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 Bible study, and everything you will find there is about what Tom just said. What is the official teaching? Nobody will teach you what is being explained here today, biblically, on the basis of the Bible. So I'm going to start in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. I think it is very important that Paul says here that ye be not soon shaken in mind or trouble. So, here already he gives the idea that is something that is not happening very soon. That's right. More in the distant future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, this is a verse we have to nag on a little bit. Yeah. Let no man deceive you. Tom, we are living in a world where people love to listen to men, right? Yeah. They love to listen to uh, MacArthur and other people who explain the Bible and um, a blue letter Bible experts and, and all these stuff. And they love to listen to their pastor in the church. They just love to listen to man and man's teaching. They just don't understand that man is fallible and most of the time corrupt and wicked and not a true Christian and therefore will most of the time not tell you the biblical truth. Let no man deceive you. So that means that everything you are taught by man you have to weigh against the truth that is in the Bible. That's the only way how you can see if somebody is correct or is a liar. Mm -hmm. When you put his words to the test and see what does the Bible say about that subject and what does that man say about that subject. Are those two the same? Then he speaks the truth. Are those two not the same? Then he does not speak the truth because the light is not in him. That's right. I guess you agree with me so far, right? Yes, I do. And Paul is warning the Thessalonians who had already been deceived by the mouth of man that Christ's return was imminent. And Paul is plainly saying, let no man deceive you by any means. All right? He mm -hmm. says, whether it is, uh, uh, where, where does it say, whether by spirit or, or by word or by letter as from us, don't even let anybody forge a letter as if it came from me. Here I am writing with my own hand, telling you the plain truth. Don't let any means that they conjure up to deceive you on this issue, here is the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to do it in writing. Okay? You've been deceived thinking that the day of the Lord is at hand. Here is the truth. The day of the Lord is not yet at hand, and here's what must take place before that day of the Lord. All right? First... In, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that is the day of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Okay, that, that speaks of a great apostasy, a falling away from the faith. A great apostasy. A great falling away must come first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. All right, what is falling away from the faith? First of all, the Bible plainly says, tells us you are saved by grace through faith in Christ and his shed blood. Not of works, 
lest any man should boast. You are saved by the unmerited favor of Almighty God, grace. And grace cometh by faith, not works. Faith, that is, belief in the only begotten Son of God, the one who became the Lamb of God from the very foundation of the world, whose blood redeems us from sin, death, and hell. And to confirm what Tom just said, I just refer to you to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 17. That is the part of the Bible that convinced Martin Luther that he was wrong being on his knees in the Roman Catholic Augustine monk uh, situation that he was asking to for salvation. Because in Romans chapter 1 verse 17 we read, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. That's right. And that's the message that Martin Luther, a devout Roman Catholic, an Augustinian monk, finally learned from the Scripture. He never learned it from his priests. He never learned it from his popes. He learned it from the Scripture. And he finally understood it. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. It's unmerited favor. Your sins are simply blotted out of the record if you believe that Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. No works can achieve salvation. You can work till the cows come home. You can work till your fingers bleed. And like Martin Luther even knew, you could crawl up and down the holy stairs until your knees bleed. But you'll never earn your way to heaven. There's only one way to merit heaven, and that is through the merit of Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross. Now, that's not what Roman Catholicism teaches. Roman Catholicism teaches, and you can believe Martin Luther when he said, you must earn your way to heaven in the Roman Catholic Church. There's no such thing as grace in the Roman Catholic Church. It's all about works. All right. It's you must perform the sacraments. You must pray to the saints. You must com <clears throat> confess your sins to a priest. You must gain, gain absolution from a priest. You must have intercession of the priest to God. You must participate in the Mass and crucify Christ afresh over and over every day. That's Roman Catholicism. Everything is a work in the Roman Catholic Church. There's no such thing as grace in the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther came to that realization, but Martin Luther was a latecomer to that realization. All Christians throughout history understood that papal Rome was that great falling away that Paul spoke about. That the Roman Catholic Church was that great apostasy that Paul predicted. And its rise from the time of this letter to the Thessalonians was imminent. As a matter of fact, even in Paul's day, the workings of the rise of the Roman Catholic Church were already beginning. Okay? There were those, even among Paul's uh, churches, who started the false rumor that Christ had already come. He mentions Hymenaeus and Philetus, who said that Christ had already come spiritually. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about a spiritual return of Jesus Christ. It talks about a literal, visible return of Jesus Christ. But Hymenaeus and Philetus taught this lie that Jesus had already returned, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Now, what do you suppose is the natural outcome of that? Well, people began to to demand that if Christ came spiritually, well, then he must have a physical manifestation somewhere that someone would have to speak in the name of and in the behalf of Jesus Christ who had returned spiritually. There, there's a physical, visible church in the earth, and there must be a physical and visible head of that church or 
or it does us no good if Christ returns spiritually if there's not a visible physical head to take his place. Do you understand where that's going? The rise of the papacy. The papacy today and always, even from the very beginning, claimed itself to be the visible manifestation of Jesus Christ on the earth. The papacy, which was soon to rise only a few centuries after the writing of this letter to the Thessalonians, solved the dilemma of Hymenaeus and Philetus, who said that Jesus Christ had already returned spiritually. The kingdom of heaven is already among men but we can't see it. Well, that's easy to fix. We just have to have a visible manifestation of Christ. If Christ is here in the, in the Spirit, well, then he can, <clears throat> he can manifest his spiritual existence through a physical representative. He could become a Moses among men, only of the vicar of Jesus Christ the replacement of the Son of God on earth. And then the Christian world would have its visible head, and Jesus, Jesus Christ could rule and reign the world through him. And it was fulfilled. Now, what is that great falling away? What is that great apostasy that would lead to the rise of this man of sin, this son of perdition. The very thing that Paul is talking about. The day of the Lord is not at hand. Jesus Christ has not returned physically or spiritually. He never left us spiritually. We are endowed with the Spirit of Christ. He lives within us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus Christ has not physically returned. All right, and God no longer uh, dwells in temples made with hands. Paul made that perfectly clear. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. All right? The, the kingdom of Christ exists without his visible head by the indwelling of the Spirit. So why do we need a visible, a visible head, a, a physical manifestation of Christ on the earth? Why do we need a pope? We don't, all right? Why? Because the Pope is that man of sin, that son of perdition, that says that he is reigning in Christ's stead. He is the physical manifestation of Jesus Christ on the earth, and that the visible church of Jesus Christ has a visible head in the Pope and only in the Pope. You see, Paul, when he says, the, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. He was speaking of the, of the heresy began by Hymenaeus and Philetus, which led directly to the rise of the great falling away, that we must have a physical manifestation of Christ. We must have a physical spokesman through which the Spirit of God may speak to man infallibly. And that is the Pope. All right, now Paul also spoke, maybe I should let you read the scripture here at this point, but Paul spoke of something specific that was, was withholding this rise of this man of sin and this son of perdition. At the time of the writing of this epistle, the second epistle to the Thessalonians, there was going to be the rise of an antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of sin, but there was something withholding him from coming to power. Yeah, but before we jump into verse 7, which is what you are referring okay. to, I yep. think it is also important that we first read um, uh, verse 4. We can't forget now about with everything that you said, but verse 5 is very important. Yep. Because we are speaking of a letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. And in verse 5 he says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Yes. Paul, Paul uses expressions that are quote-unquote easier um, or, 
on the other hand, no, which are actually harder to understand in this letter, because he does not speak to us, or the Thessalonians in this case, face to face. You know, when I see Tom face to face, I can tell Tom things that I would never say out in the open, that I would never say, let's give an example, on television or on radio or, or on, uh, on, on the street. Something I can reveal privately would be something else than uh, something I would, uh, I mean, I, I would speak privately differently to Tom than I would speak uh, officially to him. And this is, I guess, uh, what a lot of people can understand. Well, especially if you were telling me something that was very con uh, 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 controversial and potentially extremely dangerous. Yeah, like you, uh, you would if say I would something expose to me. myself as a terrorist, you know, because this is uh, actually oh, what uh, this is actually what Paul does. Let, here. Let, let me let me get to the punch and tell the people what what's going on here. Paul is plainly. Uh, cryptic, let me say, Paul is cryptically, in this letter, reminding them of something that he was much more specific about when he was with them in person, in the flesh. Exactly. They had talked about this subject often, frequently, and in depth, who this great restrainer was that was, that was uh, preventing or letting the rise of Antichrist the rise of the man of sin. There was something pre, uh, preventing his rise, and that the man of sin, the son of perdition, could not rise to power until this restrainer was taken out of the way. Now, when he was with them, he could speak candidly. He could name names. He could name places. He could name dates. But in his letter, which might well fall into the wrong hands, he had to be very careful about what he said. Otherwise, he would put himself and he would also put his congregation in Thessalonica in danger because he was speaking of that fourth and final beast upon the earth, the Roman danger of Empire. Danger of sedition, Tom. That's right. The, the, term danger that we can of, use. the danger of sedition. And in the Roman Empire, if you were thought to be against that Roman Empire, an, uh, an opposer of the Roman Empire, or treasonous, you'd be executed. Okay? You know, Paul is a little bit in the same uh, shoes here as was Daniel when he was explaining to Nebuchadnezzar his dream. The Absolutely. only advantage that Daniel had was that he was explaining a dream, and he knew, and, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar knew that it was his own dream that was being revealed to him. If Daniel in chapter 2 did not refer to a dream Nebuchadnezzar had, but told Nebuchadnezzar, oh, you're the head of gold, but after you there will come another empire, uh, I think he would have lost his head. Certainly. And Paul was under the same restraint. He had to be careful what he said in this letter in case it fell into the hands of the Romans. That's the point I wanted to make, Tom. Uh, that's absolutely, absolutely. correct. Now, the Thessalonians and Paul and everybody knew that what the religious leaders of Jesus' day tried to do was to, to make it appear that the Lord Jesus was going to be a king and a king of kings, and therefore he was a threat to the Roman Empire. That's why the Romans cooperated with these lying Jews to have him crucified. So the same threat exists with Paul. If Paul is seen by the Roman Empire to be a threat, Paul is dead meat. And so are the Thessalonians. Now, when Paul was with the Thessalonians, he could plainly tell them who the Antichrist would be, who the man of sin is, who the son of perdition is, and he could also plainly tell them who was preventing his rise to power in proper terms, clearly understandable by his listeners. But in this letter, he had to be very careful. And this is why he says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? He was trying to excite their memories about what he talked about openly and explicitly and perfectly to their understanding, both who this, what this great falling away was all about who the man of sin would be and who the son of perdition would be, 
the same person, the man of sin, the son of perdition, are the same thing. He's the same one who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He's going to sit in the temple of God proclaiming himself that he is God. Okay, there's a, there's a great imposter coming, a great anti-Christ coming, a great counterfeit Christ coming. And Christ cannot return until this man of sin, this great antichrist, this counterfeit God on the earth is fully revealed and comes to power. And that man of sin, that son of perdition, that antichrist cannot come to power until first there comes a great falling away, make a great apostasy that makes his rise to power possible, and that man of sin be revealed. And that can't happen until the restrainer is taken out of the way. Now, common sense, my listeners, your listeners can probably already tell us by what we've told them so far, what was withholding the rise of this man of sin, the son of perdition. Yeah, but let, let us just keep them a little bit on the tip of their chairs. Mm -hmm. um, verse 3 is very important to understand in connection with <coughs> five, verse 5. Verse 3 says, let no man deceive you by any means. And verse 5 he says, remember ye not that when I was yet, that yet with you, I told you these things. Yeah. So let get, don't get deceived by anybody, because when I was with you, I already told you the truth. Paul Stay is simply saying, truth. if anybody comes to you and tells you anything different than what I told you to your face, he's a liar. Exactly. Very important point to make here. That's right. And then he goes on to say in verse 6 and says, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Verse okay. 6 is a very underestimated verse in the understanding. That's right. And, and I think also, Tom, that when we start getting into verse 7, which is, of course, the key of the whole chapter, we have to um, refer to the false teaching that you have been taught all your life who that one is who now letteth. Oh, yeah. And therefore, in verse 6, we already read, and now ye know that withhold this, that he might be revealed in his time. Here he is speaking about the Antichrist. Here he is right. speaking about the wicked man, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Okay? okay. That is in verse 6. But okay. now we come to the absolute key verse of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. Okay. Uh, ver, 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 uh, chapter, chapter 2, <laughs> um, verse 7. This is of absolutely importance. And this is the whole reason why we even started this study. Because with this verse, there's so much detention going on in the world. And Tom has experienced that for himself during the reading of this book. The foundations under attack. I don't know if he wants to go in that. I leave that up to him if he wants to do that or not. But we have to get this verse absolutely straight. And first of all, Tom will tell you after I read this verse exactly what is the quote unquote official teaching that Tom has been even indoctrinated with all his life through the pulpits when he was sitting in the church bench. For the mystery of, in uh, of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's right. Only he who now letteth, oh. Tom. What is taught in the churches today, who is the one who now letteth? Well, we've been taught that this Antichrist, this man of sin, this son of perdition, the one who exalts himself above God and is worshipped like a god and sits in the temple of God, is some future individual. Someone not yet revealed in the world. Someone who will come in the distant future. And what is withholding his rise to power is those who are filled with the Holy Ghost. And that it is the Holy Ghost that is restraining the son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, rise to power. And that he cannot come to power until we, who are possessors of the Holy Spirit, are taken out of the way. It's the Holy Spirit, according to this false, counterfeit, lying churches today that are telling us that the Holy Spirit has to be taken out of the way before the man of sin is revealed, before the Antichrist is revealed. 
And so, therefore, they conclude that it must be the rapture that God's people, possessors and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, must be taken out of this world before the man of sin can be revealed, the son of perdition the one who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is sitting in the temple of God proclaiming himself that he is God. When we find in actual fact that man of sin was revealed two, nearly 2,000 years ago and still deceives the whole world, still exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, sits in a temple of God claiming himself that he is God in the flesh. It's the one Paul predicted that was imminent to arise and that there was someone restraining his rise to power, which you have to know was the reigning, ruling Caesars of the Roman Empire. Now, had Paul spoken openly in these terms in this writing, he would have had to say, that the Roman, the pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars, the one that killed our Christ, who crucified our Christ, he is going to be taken out of the way. In other words, the Roman Empire, as we know it, is going to be overthrown. Now, if Paul would have said this, Rome would have been down their throats in Thessalonica and killed Paul and all the church at Thessalonica. Paul could not be as candid in writing as he was in public or in private with these Thessalonian Christians. The point I made earlier, yeah. That's right. So clearly we understand Paul is talking about the Roman Empire under the Caesars. They could, the man of sin, the son of perdition, could not come to power until that restrainer was taken out of the way. <coughs> Had he tried to rise to power before the fall of the Roman Caesars, the Roman Caesars would have done away with him, just like they did away with Christ, just like they would do away with the Thessalonians and Paul. And therefore, Paul had to use the same caution. He had to protect the Thessalonians, never let it be said in public that this Roman Empire is going to be toppled. It's going to be taken out of the way. Yes, indeed, that very government that helped crucify our Christ is going to be taken out of the way, and something worse is going to replace it. It's going to be Rome. It's going to be centered in Rome. It's going to be just as pagan, just as brutal, just as horrific as was the ancient pagan Roman Empire, but it's all going to do it in the name of Christ. It's going to appear to be Christian. It's going to exalt itself above God himself, even while he acknowledges the God of the Bible. And that can't be fulfilled by anybody in history. That can't be fulfilled by anybody today or in the future, but by the papacy itself. Now, are you beginning to understand why they must teach that this man of sin, this son of perdition, the one that would destroy that would be drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, who would deceive the whole world? Do you see why they have to project him into the distant future in order to deceive the whole world? <clears throat> we find in actual fact, in historical fact, in prophetic fact, in scriptural fact, backed up by history and the testimony of multitudes of millions of Christians throughout the last 2,000 years, that that power which replaced the Caesars, which was more brutal, which was more bloodthirsty, that which was opposed to Christ by saying that it replaced Christ as his vicar is none other than the papacy, and it has ruled and reigned throughout the Christian era, nigh unto 1,800 years. And furthermore, and most, most significantly, is this was known and understood and preached against. Uh, the papacy was preached against by every Bible-believing Christian throughout the entire 1,800-year Christian history. 
and that history reveals that no one has been more vicious and brutal and persecuting and drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus than the popes throughout history. Now, again, somebody's going to say, Tom, you're, you're, you're talking about a man of sin that lives 1,800 years? Listen, this is easy to understand. It's easy to explain. We know that every president from George Washington on to the current fool in Washington are called Mr. President don't you? President of the United States refers to every president from the beginning of this country to the last. Every president is a successor of the previous president. The presidency never dies. But men do die. Three score and ten years we're allotted. Okay? So if a man of sin is going to live more than 70 years, he must have a successor. Therefore, he must occupy an office that never dies. And that's exactly who is referred to when it is mentioned the man of sin, the son of perdition, is the first pope, the second pope, and every successor after him. From the beginning of the papacy all the way to the end. The man of sin is whatever man sits on the throne in the Roman Catholic Church. The man of sin never dies. The son of perdition never dies, not until Christ's literal return. When the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy, will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming and by the spirit of his mouth. And why will the brightness of his coming destroy him? Why will the spirit of his mouth destroy him? Because Jesus, all he's got to do is say, you never were my vicar. You are not my vicar now or evermore. You are the man of sin, the son of perdition. And what do you think the whole Christian world's going to think when they see Jesus visibly stand before their eyes in all his glory? when he addresses the papacy from the first one to the last in all succession and universally condemns every one of them as the Antichrist of his time. Now this is what was believed and taught and preached from the pulpits of every God-fearing, Bible-believing church throughout history. And we learn, if we study this history, because there are many, many books still available, still in print, that we can all read precisely what Christians believed all throughout history. And there's one thing they agreed on. Two things, actually, they agreed on. Jesus is the Christ, and the papacy is the Antichrist. Now, I'll bet you didn't know that, did you? You, Bible, you, you, you church-going Christians have never been taught what every Christian believed and taught throughout the entire Christian era. All you're familiar with is that the man of sin, the son of perdition, doesn't come until the very end of time, just before Christ returns. When in fact, all Bible-believing Christians prior to about the middle of the 1800s believed and taught this very thing. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist is the papacy. The Antichrist rose to power after the fall of the Caesars. The same Roman Empire just morphed from the pagan Roman Empire to the pagan Christian Roman Empire under the popes. That great apostasy, that great of falling away did occur. It's a fact of recorded history. It's undisputable. And we are just simply the tail enders of this great falling away. Thanks. 